So Thunderfoot essentially put together a video which is 30 minutes about the Miso protest. He starts it by talking about one person. Black son of a multi-millionaire, still the SJW victim. Yeah, you can see where this was going to go. No, this isn't going to be a point by point critique whereby I fall into the narrative of being someone against Black Lives Matter or for them. Instead, I'm going to point out what's been nagging me about Thunderfoot's approach and try to be the bigger man here. You see, I followed Thunderfoot for the Anita Sarkeesian videos and found that some of the research to be good while some of the approach to be self-centered aggrandizing to stroke Thunderfoot's ego. The gods know this guy doesn't need an ego boost. Regardless, when he approached this topic, I can only facepalm so hard. If you follow Gamergate at all, you know very well that the problems of feminism aren't the only issues. A corporate media structure, which allows for them to fan the flames of ignorance, was central to what a number of people were against. And Thunderfoot falls right into their narrative about what's been going on without any actual research outside the mainstream media. So he talks about two people at the center of the Mizo controversy. One of them is a black hunger striker, Peyton Head. The other is a communications adjunct professor who tried to silence the press. The second one is so retarded. I'm not going to address it, except to say that the First Amendment allows for freedom of the press, so anyone recording has those rights and you can't stop them. Hell, even the police can't, and we know how that's been going on for them in the digital age. Anyway, the point is that he takes the entire time of the video for two character assassinations, Peyton Head's father being a millionaire, so he's an angry black man, and even more stuff. To be fair, I got through half the video, then stepped back and thought about what in the hell did I just watch? There was no discussion of the problems and plight of the students. No discussion with faculty, just demonizing the people that are getting fed up with paying a lot more for college and getting a lot less out of it. The video exemplified the problems I've had with demagoguery for a while. In essence, it's people using emotional appeals to make you anger and rage at other groups without rhyme or reason. Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, and Anita Sarkeesian can be considered examples of this. But to really understand demagoguery, you have to get to the source of it. And that's through one person the internet never met, nor have they looked into them. His name would be Father Coughlin. Now I want to stress, this is a man who used emotional appeals to gain support. But he did that for different groups in his life. Similar to Trump or Thunderfoot now, this is a man that used the means to help his church when it was at its lowest along with bashing Jews and communism when that garnered attention. He was a demagogue for liberals before becoming a demagogue for conservative interests and eventually when faced with the decision to continue onwards or turn away from the cloth, he chose the cloth and led a quiet life. But just listen to this interview on KPFA about him. This is Pacifica Radio's Letters and Politics on today's show. That he was probably the first of all the electronic era demagogues. When we were talking about the numbers of people listening to him, he might well have been the most influential. Uh, and I think he was prototypical. In other words, the way we understand demagoguery today has so much to do with studying Father Coughlin. Today we're going to be in conversation about demagoguery and the story of Father Charles Coughlin. My guest is Richard Porotsky. Richard Porotsky wrote a historic fictional novel about Father Coughlin called The Demigod. Richard Porotsky is a longtime radio professional, and our stations KPFA and KPFK will be familiar with Richard Porotsky as he once served as station general manager for both of those radio stations. Richard Porotsky joins us from Long Island, New York, via Skype. Richard Porotsky, good to talk to you again. Good to talk with you, Mitch, as always. And I must say it's it's a thrill for me any time I get a chance to talk with a grand old man of broadcasting like you. <laughs> I'll just leave that. At, let's stay away from the demagoguery here, uh, Mr. Karatsky. <laughs> okay. uh, actually, no. In, in fact, let's jump into demagoguery and, and what it is. And, and first, let's uh, here, here's what uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, the American version, uh, says that a demagogue is. It's a political leader who seeks support by appealing to popular desires and prejudices rather than by using rational argument. What more would you say uh, constitutes a demagogue and what is demagoguery? 
That's a fine definition, Mitch. I would add to it that demagoguery is the use of propaganda techniques that are designed to avoid, subvert, and for the most part, overpower rational thought to make a direct emotional connection and appeal. His uh, rise was rather unremarkable. Uh, the one thing, the one telling thing about Coughlin, if there's anything that could have predicted he would become an effective demagogue, it is that in his education, uh, both in the seminary as, as well as in college, his teachers said that he wasn't always the sharpest student. He didn't always have all the facts he needed to make his points. But he had such a style and such conviction that they gave him good grades simply because of his presentational qualities. Those were vital to him uh, when he became a, a full-fledged demagogue. He wound up eventually at a church in suburban Michigan. When he first got there, this is in the 1920s, Mitch, and at the time, the Ku Klux Klan was having something of a, rev of a revival. And the Klan was, of course, against African Americans, it was against Jews, and it was against Roman Catholics, as well as immigrants. So, not surprisingly, shortly after Father Coughlin arrived in suburban Detroit, his church was burned by the Klan, and at that particular time, he made a vow that he would stand up to the Klan at every opportunity, and he would rebuild the church and make certain that no one or no group could ever bring it down, and he did. Um, one of the reasons why he went on the air when he did in the 20s was essentially to raise money to build a new church and to support uh, actions that were very necessary. Once the Depression hit, the government was rather slow to respond in terms of the needs of the people. And Coughlin was one of those who took money that he was raising um, through various means, but especially through the radio broadcasts, and he put them into soup kitchens to feed the hungry. I'd like to make this point simply because it's so easy for us to you know, find that, you know, there are aspects of people, even a majority of aspects of folks that we don't like, and we believe they are total villains. And yet, Coughlin wasn't that case. He did have good qualities. He did do some good things. He, he was a populist. He, he supported popular programs. He, he supported many self, uh, social welfare programs. Yes, he did, Mitch. And he would have gone on supporting them. And I, I really can't say that his support of these was totally a matter of altruism. He honestly believed that by supporting President Roosevelt, that he would become, to some degree, a member of the administration. But, of course, that never happened, and it couldn't happen, because certainly the Roosevelt administration couldn't afford to officially sanction a demagogue like Coughlin and bring him into the inner circle. Once it became clear to Coughlin that this was not the case, that he he had made a mistake and he was never going to be a confidant or uh, a member of the FDR administration, he decided that he would have to make some adjustment to remain popular and to remain an important figure. He couldn't rely on Roosevelt anymore. So initially, he worked with two other demagogues of the era, Dr. Francis Townsend and Senator Huey Long, to try to mount a campaign against Roosevelt in the 36th election. When that failed, and you had mentioned this before, Mitch, uh, you had talked about how Coughlin started out as a populist and then turned to, a, uh, to become a, a rabid anti-Semite and a supporter of fascist regi regimes like Nazi Germany. And that's the key to demagoguery, too. Demagogues have beliefs, but they don't necessarily hold true throughout the career of the demagogue. Remember, the important thing for the demagogue is to be at the front of the parade and appear to be leading it, no matter which direction it's going. That was what Coughlin dealt with. So after the, the, his failure in the 36th election, 
he made a 180 degree turn, politically at least. He conceded the left and left of center or center left to Roosevelt. And he decided, I can only now be a counter to Roosevelt, so I'm going to appeal to the right and far right. And that's exactly what he did. The internet makes it incredibly easy to do any form of demagoguery. Thunderfoot is guaranteed success with his approach because all anyone has to do is say, I agree with you, nod their head, and then get into fights with opposing sides as if they're in a tribe. But then again, one of the biggest things he constantly rails on is feminism and the cult of ideas that begins there. So how is he different? Essentially, Thunderfoot cultivates a rock star personality akin to a certain physicist that everyone knows as a smart man, Albert Einstein. Yeah, we're going there. You see, if you don't know much about the issue, Einstein had a very public battle with a certain philosopher by the name of Henry Bergson. No one really remembers Henry Bergson nowadays, but Jimena Canelis explains the massive split of humanities and STEM that seems to have come from it. The consequences of this split are devastating, but let me let you hear it from her. Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jesrich. On July 11th, 1923, Albert Einstein gave his Nobel Prize lecture on the fundamental ideas and problems of the theory of relativity. Probably not a surprise to most, as the theory is the most important discovery to physics since Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz came up with calculus. But it was not the theory of relativity that Einstein won the prize for. The prize was for his discovery of the photoelectric field, in which electrons emit from most metals when light shines upon the metals. Einstein's lecture on the theory of relativity was, in fact, an act of defiance, as his theory came under scrutiny after he entered a debate with famed French philosopher of the time, Henry Bergson on the nature of time. It was a major debate whose reverberations can still be felt today. My guest today argues that it was a debate that even helped put philosophy a status behind that of science. Today we're going to be in conversation about this debate, Albert Einstein, Henry Bergson, and the nature of time. My guest is Jimena Canales. She holds the Thomas M. Siebel Chair in the History of Science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And she's the author of the book, The Physicist and the Philosopher, Einstein, Bergson, and the debate that changed our understanding of time. Jimena Canales, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. But during the meeting, Einstein said, uttered a very scandalous sentence. He said, the time of the philosophers does not exist. And here we are, Einstein has been invited primarily by philosophers, the physicists, the Société de Physique, he didn't give a lecture to them and he utters this this phrase the time of the philosophers doesn't exist and in front of him in the audience is sitting a man who we don't remember much today but who at the time and in, in the first decades of the 20th century was more famous than, than Einstein confronted with <laughs> with this challenge so then um, Bergson proceeded to write a whole book refuting relativity, and this is the story that I cover in, in, in my book. The repercussions, as you say, were sorely felt at the evening when Einstein re- received the Nobel Prize. Again, the important date here is April 6, 1922, when Einstein and Bergson publicly met and discussed the issue of time. Do you think Einstein, if it wasn't for that meeting, would have won the Nobel Prize for his theory of relativity? The person who awarded the prize in Sweden, Svante Rehenius, was very clear, and that was the explanation that he gave. There probably were many other reasons as well, but the culprit that evening was listed as Bergson, and he said the great philosopher Bergson in Paris has contested the theory, and this theory is um, um, still being tested but most importantly he said the value of it will depend on epistemologists to figure out if we should adopt it or not so the verdict in a sense was given to philosophy as uh, having the ultimate say with respect to relativity and that's what's meant by epistemologists Yes, epistemologists would generally be people who study knowledge, and, and, and that goes to philosophers of science. And that's one of the areas of expertise of uh, Bergson and many of his students. So 
that was the reason that was given to Einstein right, right in front of him. And I, it seems that it was the moment where Einstein felt the consequences of his very provocative statement that, that uh, day in Paris, the April 6, 1922. Tell me about what the debate represents. And you touched upon this earlier, Jimena Canales, about how we get this split in philosophy and science. Now, now scientists used to be known uh, in, the, in the 1800s as natural philosophers. Yes, exactly. And, um, and it is the question of you know, what is the philosophy behind Einstein's um, um, a theory is, is quite complex, complex because in the book when I talk about the division between science and philosophy, I'm not saying that there's no philosophical background to to Einstein's work or to Einstein's theory. He was inspired with by particular philosophers that were of a different ilk from those that were closer to Bergson. But what we do see here is the split between the humanities and the sciences, the relegation of the expertise to talk about time, uh, given to, to scientists, particularly to physics, we see the divide between our intuitive sense of time where what's important for us is what one would call the arrow of time, what, what happens in our everyday lives has to do with how we think about our memories and how our memories affect our future and where we see time flowing and a view of time that is basically connected to a deterministic static universe. Okay, can you tell me though about, about the coining of the term scientist? Yes, so the term scientist is actually quite of uh, quite recent origin and one of the moments in which um, it made its appearance was in 1830 and this was in a discussion with a poet William Hewell who tells us that the term scientist should be used because the term, term nat natural philosophy is too broad and that we need a new terminology in order to more properly distinguish branches of philosophy so that's when we start seeing hearing a lot of more people using the term the term scientist Jimena Canales thank you very much thank you Mitch for listening thank you thank you for having me on the show again now bear in mind Bergson never thought Einstein was wrong he thought he was too focused on mechanization but with this fight you can see the results of the humanities falling by the wayside in a massive way now you'll hear a lot of people argue about STEM versus humanities in a way that doesn't help anyone. Just think about what occurs with STEM. You educate your workforce to build new roads and bridges. But with the humanities, you learn critical thinking and analysis. You learn different ways of looking at the world and equipping a different lens from your own. Why in the world should we only have people learning from STEM as if the only thing you need is math? Take a look at who's fighting against the growing militarism in Japan, and it's their humanities group, the writers, the philosophers, the people that have a social conscience. But this mainly shows the results of a very narrow understanding of a situation and emotional appeals to the masses for support which don't have much in them except a veiled attempt at character assassination. How would a less vitriolic response sound? Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program about the economic aspects of our lives. Jobs, incomes, debts, you know, all of that monetary stuff that intrudes upon the rest of our lives all the time. I'm your host, Richard Wolff. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and now I teach at the New School University in New York City. Next, I want to say a few words about another story in the press this last week, a very big and important story. It has to do with the University of Missouri. And something happened there that it's partly about economics and partly about other things. But the economics is what I'm interested in, and I want to say a few words about it in case that part of the story escaped you. For those who didn't Pay attention, let me quickly remind you. 
Over the last week, it became clear that there were serious problems at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Those problems included a new administration brought in recently to run the university, and in their own words, to run it like a business. I have to say, as an economist, that it is a mystery to me, as it is to many economists, where this phrase, running it like a business, came from. The, th the reasonable thing to run like a business would be, you guessed it, a business. And a university, last I noticed, wasn't a business. It's not producing and selling things. It's trying to educate people, which is a different activity. And why one should think we should run it like a business means you don't understand the difference between producing and selling a good and service on the one hand and teaching people on the other. Imagine if we arrived at the headquarters of businesses and threw out their leadership in order to bring in someone who will run it like a school. We would all think, wait a minute, there's a confusion here. But no matter, that's what American universities have been doing for a while now, as we live in a culture which thinks that something magical attaches to the word business. So in came the businessman, uh, Mr. Wolf. No relationship to me, I'm happy to say. And he did one of those things that business folks sometimes do. He thought it would be really good for the university to save money, so he took away the medical insurance coverage of teaching assistants. You know, graduate students trying to write their doctoral dissertations, complete their education, become thereby the most educated people in the country. What a useful thing for a university to do is to make them all worried that they will not be covered if they have an injury, that they will not be covered if they get ill, that they will have financial troubles on top of already being poorly paid for the work they do as instructors, as adjuncts, and so on. This may be good business, but even that's a question, isn't it? Well, let's pursue the story. Trouble began right away. Turns out the graduate students didn't think this was a contribution to the quality of either their education or that of the students they were responsible to teach. And it turns out that much of the faculty sympathized with the graduate students and didn't agree either and began to be critical of the leader. He didn't get it too well, so he didn't change his policies. Meanwhile, this business leader in Missouri also managed to offend the growing number of African-American students on the campus by being remarkably troubled by racial discrimination, racial insensitivity, incidents on the campus that should have been major alarms about racial tensions there uh, for some period of time. It got so bad that the athletes, many of whom were African-American, on the football team got together, explained what was going on in the racial tensions, explained it to their fellow white athletes, explained it to the student body, got the, the sympathy that is a testimony to what is possible when black and white young people get together and realize an injustice when they see it and commit themselves to do it, and realize that there's something linking the miserable treatment afforded African Americans on the one hand, and the same miserable treatment afforded to workers, white and black, on the same campus by the same business-minded leaders, that they got together and they went to the coach, a white man, and they said, we don't want to play football for a university run this way. And we're not going to play football until the leader, this new business leader, is out of here, is gone, is fired. Well, it turns out that here economics play a big role. You can't make money at these business-run universities unless they can sell what the businesses are interested in, which has a lot to do with seats at sporting events, football games, basketball games, in big arenas, in big auditoriums, in big playing fields. And when the athletes said, we're not playing, that was money that the University of Missouri wouldn't get. 
and you hit them then in their pocketbook. And this was a crescendo. The athletes wouldn't play. The graduate teachers were threatening not to teach with their medical insurance taken away. The faculty were angry that all of this was happening. But that last straw was the solidarity of the African-American athletes who took the leadership and galvanized white supporters, white fellow students too, many of them. And the president was booted out of there last week. That top of the, the business community taking over was fired, not by anyone else, by their own action and lack of action on the obvious problems they could not or would not solve. It was a sign of black and white people getting together, understanding that helping each other with what afflicts them points them together at the same enemy, and that if they get together, they have the power, and the people who run the universities don't. It was a wonderful lesson, not only in working people and students who do a lot of work, too, on the modern business-run university, that they, if they get together, have the power, and that the power of those at the top dissolves like sugar in water the minute those at the bottom say, we've had it, no more, we're going to take charge and rearrange things. It is a tragedy that it took this long, and it is a tragedy now to see how many in the media need to portray all of these events as if they were only about racial difference, racial tension. Yes, that was part of the mix. It was an ugly, unjustified abuse of African-American citizens. But that's not all it was. And what made the change was not only the upset and anger and the leadership provided by the African-American students and athletes, it was the fact that that leadership brought together African-American and white students, teachers, athletes, coaches. That unity made it impossible for the university business run to continue business as usual. And that's an important straw in the winds of change sweeping across the United States. More or less a focus on the movements and the students fighting for change. People are being deceived by a mass media which has a sensationalist bias. Outrage culture comes from far more than the persecuted social justice warriors. It also comes from a number of reactionaries who utilize sophistry to climb up on the people they destroy. Education doesn't require you to inflame hatred against your opponents or antagonize them for being black. Political differences and political debate don't have to be brutal or tribalistic cults to survive. Our society is sadly polarizing and the demagoguery we look into isn't helping. Tom Hartman says in the book, what would Jefferson do that we have to avoid these types of people? In What Would Jefferson Do? Tom Hartman basically describes three separate people that are enemies of democracy. Warlords, theocrats, and plutocrats. A warlord will try to use national security to undermine democracy. A theocrat attacks a democracy. And, by Tom Hartman's own words, the new aristocracy would be the corporatism and the monopolies that we have seen grow and rise in the last 40 or 50 years since the 1980s. I agree. What kind of society are we living in when we give in to the four horsemen of calumny? Fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. It's truly not a society worth living in when we spread hatred for all to see. I don't hate anyone that I criticize, but a look at the larger picture here should be worth looking into. Surrounding Thunderfoot is a number of people that take his words, take the rhetoric, and treat him as some form of rock star prophet that can't be wrong when the questions he presents are loaded anyway. Hell, even I can agree with some of his gamer arguments while not liking the feminism stuff and how it works to divide people based on gender, but with this this focus on black people and feminists and no awareness of what is the result of such arguments? 
that's not something I want around me. 